pleasure of uh, introducing Jane Hilston from Edinburgh University, in the far east of Scotland. Um, and Jane's going to give us some insight into uh, formal methods in computing and also why she became interested in that area and some reflections on the process from going from PhD student to professor. Okay, so thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? No, because I've not switched it on. Is that better? Everybody hear me? Okay, so I was very pleased to be invited to come and give this talk, but then I realized, oh, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge because you're a very diverse audience with very different backgrounds, studying lots of different topics. So what I've aimed to do is to give you quite a high-level view of my research from my PhD up to the current time, um, and along the way, some insights of why things went the way they did, which I thought might be interesting to you as you're in the process of establishing your own research and um, things don't always go quite how you want and you have to make the best of what you've got so I thought some of those insights might be interesting to you. I do appreciate that for a PhD student having your supervisor stand up and say anything personal is a bit like having your dad dance at your birthday party so my apologies to Ali Reza and Anastasis who are in the audience but it's not going to get too personal. So I wanted it to be quite a, a light-hearted talk. <coughs> that's the first thing that's happening with my advance is not working. Uh, so I found this cartoon on the, the web. And certainly it's very true of how my brain was as a PhD student. I had vast amounts of creativity when it came to finding ways to spend my time that weren't really quite directly advancing my research. I certainly had a huge amount of guilt and a large worry center at the back of my brain. But it all worked out okay. So if this is a picture of your brain, go with it, okay? It's probably going to work out okay. And if they were honest, your supervisor would probably own up that there was a certain amount of truth in this for them. The other one I found that I quite liked was this one. Um, I see none of you are first year students, apparently, because none of you have come attempting to make notes. Um, <laughs> so you're all, you're all just here because you, you're supposed to be. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is an area called stochastic process algebras, which is a particular branch of formal methods that are used for quantified <coughs> analysis, particularly what's called performance modeling. And I'll explain there how this has developed, why it developed, um, and a little bit of how this analysis techniques that we apply within this formal methods have grown more and more sophisticated over the course of about the last 20 years. And at the end, I'll show an example of how these are used. It's quite a simple example because I have to fit it on the slide, but it'll give you some impression of what all this theory has gone on to allow you to do in practice. Along the way, as I say, I'm going to talk a little bit about why this research developed as it did for me. Okay, so it's quite a personal kind of perspective. So from that point of view, I thought it'd be useful for you to have an idea of, of my biography. So I started out as a mathematician. I did a, a BA in mathematics, so it was a BA because it was pure maths. There was very little applied in it. And I, from there, I loved my mathematics. I went and I did a master's degree in the US. Uh, with that stage, with a view to possibly doing a PhD. The topic I got into is something called algebraic topology which is a fantastic game. I don't know if anybody knows it. it it's uh, it's a, a study of algebraic signatures of various topological spaces. It's quite a small area. And much as I loved it, I realized after two years, which was the MSc in the US, that it, if I did this as a PhD, I was going to spend the rest of my life basically playing a game that only a few hundred other people in the world could understand and I felt I wanted to do something a bit more practical. You know, that seemed a little self-indulgent, I guess. So I came back and I took a job in software industry, and I worked for Logica in their financial systems in the city as a, what they called a business analyst. So I wasn't actually <coughs> writing programs, I was writing functional specs and talking to clients. Um, I'm ashamed to say that in the 80s, that was what they did. They made the boys program and the girls talk to clients. Uh, very much the way it was. Um, I quite enjoyed that, but I realized after about a year and a half, they'd sort of trained me to what they wanted me to do, and then they just wanted me to keep doing it. And what I really enjoy is learning new things. 
So then I looked to coming back into academia. First I got a job at a business school, which was sort of an easy transition because I'd been working in the city. And then I got a position up in Edinburgh on a European funded project, which was performance modeling. But I wanted to also do a PhD because by then I knew I really wanted to get into academia and PhD is, is one of the requirements basically to having a job in academia. So I did my PhD part time. When my contract ended, I took a short period being full time to finish my PhD. And then I've just stayed at Edinburgh, progressing through the ranks. Okay. So the work I'm going to talk about is really coming from this period here. But it's worth bearing in mind that background there because it's definitely shaped the work that I've done. Okay. <coughs> so when I got to Edinburgh, Robin Milner was still there and there was a very strong group working on concurrency and process algebras. So although my, I was employed to write software actually at this stage for um, performance modeling tools, which were largely simulations, I was going to every seminar I could that Robin gave and anyone else and learning about process algebras. And I must say it was kind of love at first sight. This was what excited me much more than my day job. So those that don't know what a process algebra is, it's a formal description language for capturing the behavior of concurrent systems. It has very simple primitives. The idea is that you have agents or processes that undertake actions. Okay? And then you put those agents in parallel, and then those actions may synchronize. And so you build up compositionally a view of the behavior within your system. So if we have our little agent here, it will have a number of different states. So although it's capable over its lifetime of doing A, B, and C, in a particular state here, I've just colored it blue, but it would be recognized syntactically usually, it can do A, then it might progress after an A to do a B, and then to a state where it could do a B or a C. So we're really very simply describing the behaviors, the capabilities of systems. Okay. And then we put those in parallel. How do we, we build up something we can do analysis on? Well, we use something called structured operational semantics to take that linguistic description, that syntactic description of, of your model, and make what's called a label transition system. So given a process algebra model, we apply some rules and get a label transition system. And what's a label transition system? Well, it's just a graph like this, where you have um, nodes for the different states that you might be in and arcs for the actions that you might undertake. And those, those arcs are labeled with the actions, so that's why it's a labeled transition system. Okay. So obviously this is a very simple example, but generally we're talking about much larger examples. So the beauty is that structured operational semantic rules are things that are easy to implement and so you can automatically generate these labeled transition systems. And then once you've got one of those, you can use it for all kinds of verification of your system. Okay? So you can ask, will the system ever arrive at a particular state? Okay? So say this is a bad state, then you want to show that it's not possible for it to arrive at that state, and that would be a safety property. Or we may have two different descriptions, one being the high-level specification and the other being the implementation of your system, and then you want to compare. Are they, in some sense, showing the same behavior? And again, we can write algorithms and have this done automatically. Or we can do what's called model checking, where we have an associated logic which can express properties of our system, and then we can ask, is it true that this property holds somewhere within my system? So that's the kind of things that people were doing with process algebras in the late 80s, early 90s when I came to Edinburgh. And I say, it chimed very much with me because of my background in working in algebra. Okay. Why is it called an algebra? Because so far it doesn't look very algebraic. It's because the structure of the language is an algebra and has certain rules, which means that you can prove properties about models by proving it once in terms of the language. Okay, so you don't need to prove property, some properties of models, model by model. You prove it once for the language, 
and you've got rules about how you can make substitutions in the language, and that takes advantage of, of things like congruence. Okay, so a very simple example, which we'll use throughout the talk, is just the idea that you've got a processor that needs to use a resource. So this is the kind of thing we look at all the time in, in performance, not usually quite as simple as these ones. So here we've got a processor that wants to undertake some task. Um, so process zero is our, our agent, task one is our action. We undertake that action, we re either to new state, process one, and then there may be a second task, task two, and then we cycle back to the same behavior. Our resource, meanwhile, is needed to undertake task one, but not to do task two. So the behavior of the resource, the agent is res zero, we have the action task one, we reach state res one, and then that undertakes some reset action and is available again for use. Okay? And then our composition here is just that we have both in their initial state and we're forcing them to synchronize on um, task one. And then if we make the label transition system of this, even without seeing this operational semantic rules, you can, I think, guess what this is going to be. That what we have is then here synchronizing on this task one, so they both advance, and then they can do their other actions in either order. So either this one advances, does its reset, and then this one, or this, the task two is done, and it has to wait for the resource to be reset before it can do the next task one. Okay? As I say, this is a very simple example, but this is the kind of thing that we get from the label transition system. And then you can ask questions like, is it always the case after you've done a task one that a task two is completed before you do another task one? This is so small, you can see it's obviously true, but if you think of a real system, that's much harder to do just by thinking about it, and this gives you an automated way to approach the problem. So this was all very well and good. I was developing my love of process algebras, but this wasn't what I was paid for. What I was paid to do was to work on performance modeling. So performance modeling is the area that's concerned with the dynamic behavior of systems um, in a quantified way. Okay, so the process algebra gives you a logical behavior of the system, but it doesn't give you any kind of quantification. So for example, I said that either the resource can do its reset or the processor can do task one, but I can't tell you how long either of those is going to take or the relative probability of the ordering. And when we want to do performance modeling, those quantities are important because we're concerned with timeliness, whether you're going to get a good response in good time, or whether you're going to make good use of your resources. Okay, so I've said that. And so I wanted to combine these things. I had to do the performance, I wanted to do the process algebra, so to me, it was completely obvious what you do is you design a process algebra that lets you do performance modeling. Okay? And this was the beginning of stochastic process algebras. So we add in quantification to that simple description language so that we can do performance modeling with that. This was an advance for performance modeling because previously the approaches were not very formal. There was some work on Petrinet's. Uh, which are, of course, formal, but they're not compositional. So you run into problems because models get very large and it's hard to describe them. So the process algebra let you do performance modeling in a way that was both formal and compositional, and then automatically derive the measures that are of interest to performance modelers, such as throughput, utilization, and response time. <coughs> so I'm sure everyone's told you this. Find a topic you love. Okay, And even if you're finding, as I was, I was on an externally funded project, my job was defined with a bit of creativity, you should be able to find ways to combine these. Okay, So even if you feel, I've got to do this because my supervisor told me, with a bit of imagination, you should be able to find something that makes you passionate and keeps your supervisor happy. Okay, so what did this process algebra look like? Well, it's just a small modification from a classic process algebra that we still have the idea of a, a basic action, but now we call it an activity because it has a duration, and the way that we represent that duration is an exponential distribution. Exponential distributions are um, very simple distributions that have a single parameter, 
and the special property of being memoryless that we're able to take advantage of. And so the only thing that we need to add into the syntax to capture that duration is this notion of rate here. So it's not a very big um, change from a classic process algebra, but it gives you a much richer set of properties that you can then establish from your model. So in particular, you can derive a mathematical structure called a continuous time Markov chain from the formal process algebra description. And we do this using structured operational semantic rules, and we generate a label transition system. There's just a sort of technical um, bit of, not difficulty, but something you need to be careful of, that here, instead of just noting logically that there is a transition between states, if there's more than one transition between those states, you need to keep track of how many there are. So we call it a multi-transition system. And then it's very straightforward, given that graph structure that we had, to treat that as the state transition diagram of the Markov chain, <coughs> and then we generally characterize Markov chains as matrices. And then there are very well-established linear algebra routines that let us derive those performance measures that we're interested in. So we've built a link from the formal world of process algebras to the slightly more practical world or quantified world of performance modeling. Okay. So what can we do now? Well, if we think of those kind of analyses that we did before with process algebras, we can add in the quantification. So we can ask not just will I reach a particular state, but what's the expected time until I arrive at that particular state? Or conversely, you might say, at time 10, what's the probability I've visited that state already? And so you're getting richer information from the system because you've put more information in. So similarly with properties, we can ask, with a proper logic that also uh, captures the quantified information, given a property, what's the probability that it will hold? or how long is it from a particular starting state until I reach a state where that property holds. So I'm going to explain Pepper in a little bit more detail because at the end of the talk we're going to look at an example. But it's only a small language as we'll see. So as I said, the primitives are components and activities or agents and actions um, in classical process algebra talk. And the key thing is that those activities are either independent or shared between components. Performance modeling is all about contention. If there's always enough resource for everyone to do what they want to do, you generally don't need a performance model because you haven't got a problem. Everyone is doing everything as quickly as they want to. Okay? So if you think of the, you go to the supermarket and there's nobody else there, you just do your shopping, you go to the checkout, it takes as long as it takes, and there's been no contention. And so performance has been optimized because it couldn't possibly go any faster. But that's very different if you go to the supermarket on a Friday night and you have to queue up at the deli counter, you have to queue up at the checkout, you maybe can't get to the shelves. It's the contention that creates performance problems. Okay, so that's what we're always interested in trying to find. Okay, so it's, this is the whole of the language, it's not very big. <coughs> we have this first primitive that we've already seen, which we call prefix, which says, I'm an agent or component who must do an action of type alpha with some rate f, and then I'm going to behave like a component p. So the prefix is a designated first action, it tells you what you must do first. I may have alternative behaviours. I may choose to do one or another thing, and we represent this with a choice. Then the compositionality in the language comes from this symbol <coughs> cooperation. Okay? So keep up here. This is saying I've got a component P1, and I've got a component P2, and I also have an interaction that's governed by this set L. The set L will be a set of action types, and what it means is that if P1 wants to do alpha, and alpha's not in the set L, P1 can just go ahead and do it on its own. But say it wants to do beta, and beta is in the set L, then P1 cannot progress until P2 is going to help it do it. So it's a shared action that needs both of them. So it's a synchronization, but it's a synchronization where we can adjust just which actions 
the components need to synchronize on. Okay, so this, this operand here is actually a family of operators depending on the set L. We then have the notion of hiding. We may have the capability to do an action alpha, but we really don't want to share it with somebody else. So then we might describe our behavior in terms of alpha, but then hide alpha so that it's not available in a synchronization. And that's what this does. So if I'm P and this set L contains the action alpha to the outside world, whenever I do an alpha, they don't see it, they just see a tau. And tau is just a special symbol that we use for private actions. And then we have constants just so that we can name behaviors. We have a bit of derived syntax. Since cooperation is very important, this is where our contention comes in when you're trying to share actions. We also want to recognize those cases where there is no contention very easily. So when that set is empty, we write it just with these two parallel lines to emphasize that these are independent. So they're just running concurrently, not interfering with each other. And in particular, sometimes we have a large number of entities of the same type that are not competing between themselves, although they're competing with each other for using something else. So for example, if we have all those customers in the supermarket, they're not directly interacting generally. They're all just going around doing their shopping. And so we would make a parallel array of such entities. And we write that like this. So this is just shorthand for saying, I've got multiple copies. I've got a population where they don't interact with each other, but they all have the same behavior wanting to use resources. So they compete with each other. So I was quite happy. I'd defined something using process algebra, but satisfying my boss that I was doing pro performance modeling. And then I found somebody in Germany had had the same idea. OK, so my tip here is don't panic, OK? At first, you feel as though the bottom's dropped out of your world because you think they're going to do your PhD before you. But the truth is, they're not going to do your PhD because they're not you. They haven't got your background. They've got a slightly different background. And you can just need to make sure that you're kind of playing to your own strengths. So I'd say my background was very much from the algebra. In fact, the people who um, were doing the same thing in Germany had a very different background from computer systems. And the way that our languages developed was slightly different. And in fact, it became beneficial to talk to them. What I did was I applied to the Royal Society for a small travel grant and went and visited them for a month. We didn't carve up the work between us, but it became clear then how our approaches were slightly different. And so what at first felt like, oh my goodness, that's my PhD taken away, became a great opportunity to actually strengthen my understanding of the area by seeing what they were doing with their different perspective compared with mine. So one of the ways that our languages differed was this idea of the synchronization. So it's a compositional language. You describe these agents. They each have their idea of how they're progressing with respect to time. And then you make them synchronize or cooperate on some shared actions. So if I have some idea of the rate at which I'm doing something, and Rod also has an idea of the rate at which something should progress, but then we have to do them together, you have a choice of quite what rate do you do that at. And the approach that we took with Pepper was to make an assumption that we call bounded capacity. So the bounded capacity is the idea that no, act, no component can be made to go faster than the rate that they've declared they can do this action. So you can think of this as if Rod and I were walking down to the station together. Rod's much taller than me and probably fitter than me. And so he would walk much faster than me. So his rate of getting to the station would be faster. But if we were doing that as a shared action, he's a gentleman, and he would adjust to my pace, and we would go at the slower rate. And generally, that's true. If you think of communication going down the link, then whatever rate the device that's putting packets onto the link can go, it can't make them go faster than the capacity of the link. So this is the idea of bounded capacity. And so in PEPA, what we do for shared action is we say that things will proceed at the rate of the minimum of the rates in the components who are contributing. Hmm? 
PhD supervision as well. Yes, <laughs> Rod just said it's, a, it's like PhD supervision. The supervisor might have an idea of the rate, but the student has bounded capacity. <laughs> so that's when we're sharing actions. When we're doing independent actions, we don't need to be affected by the rates of other people. Okay, so if we have a population who are all doing the same thing, but independently, the actual rate at which one of those actions occurs will be the sum of all the individual rates, because we've got more capacity. We're not constraining the capacity, we, we get a multiple of the capacity when we have a multiple of agents. Okay, so that's independent actions, shared actions, we get minimum of the capacity. So if we think of our little processor resource um, example, it's just changed in that we've added rates here. Okay, so we have some notion of the capacity of each of these components to undertake these actions. And we're now using pepper syntax, so we, this is our synchronization or shared action here. Then we get a label transition system just as before, but our labels are richer to reflect, reflect the quantified information and here, the shared action has a rate R, which is the minimum of those two individuals. So that's the label transition system. Translating that into uh, the linear algebra representation of a continuous time Markov chain is just <coughs> the very obvious graph that you derive, um, sorry, matrix that you derive from this graph that we just put in an entry. So th this is our, our state one. And this is state two, we have an entry here of R saying the rate is that. To make it a continuous time Markov chain, we have the negative row sum on the diagonal. So it's very straightforward to derive this automatically in a tool. Okay, so the structured operational semantics, as I've said, gives us some um, representation of the global states, which is made up of the individual states of each of the components. Okay, so let's go back a second. Our state here has the local state of process and the local state of the resource. And the same is true for each of the states. Okay, so we can think of this in general of being something like this. We, we have each of those and we get the product state space, which very quickly can get complicated. I and mean, this is just schematic here. <coughs> And as long as that's not too big, then what we can do is, is just what I showed you with that very simple example, that we use the label transition system, we generate that product state bit space, and then we make the Markov chain as a matrix, and then use linear algebra, a well-known technique, to get a probability distribution of being in each of the possible states. Okay. So what's too big? The current capability of our tool and most of the tools that do this explicitly for what's called numerical solution using linear algebra <coughs> is about 10 million. So it's quite big, you know, but it's not big enough, unfortunately, because we can very quickly make quite simple looking descriptions that get up to that size. Okay. So this is the problem known as state space exploration. Quite simple descriptions will very quickly <coughs> generate matrices that, in theory, we know how to solve, but in practice we can't because they're simply too large to fit in memory. And if we take uh, this very simple example <coughs> here and we just get up to 10 copies of the processor and 10 copies of the resource, we can get to, let me just work out what this is, I think, is that 1 million states? Yeah, that's one million states. Now, this is being very naive because this representation and interpretation is treating each of those 10 processors as an individual. Okay? So we have a list of 10, and we're really distinguishing which processor is busy and which one is not. Okay, so this was the first obvious step, was how do we instead shift to having a less explicit state representation. <coughs> Sometimes we really want to know that a particular individual processor is doing something. But remember, these are just copies of the same thing, so there's no distinguishing features. So it doesn't make sense to treat them as individuals. We just need to know the number that are in particular states. Oh, so 
This problem of state, space, state space explosion has been the major topic in performance modeling for the last at least 40 years. Okay, and there are many different techniques. So this is looking at continuous time Markov chains as descriptions of systems to work out their performance, and they're just too big. So people have been looking at this for a long time, and all the easy results, and most of the easy results, were done in the 60s and 70s, and it's really quite hard now. But I would say don't necessarily shy away from that. I studied this problem of state space explosion. I had a new tool because I had the process algebra which has compositionality and formality which we hadn't had before. And then actually, even after my PhD, I went on and continued to work on that problem for at least another probably 10 years. Um, and it's good actually to take on a really big challenge. The trick is not to think you have to solve it all in your PhD. So what I always try and say to my PhD students is, the PhD is just the key to the playground. It would be really sad if you did your best work in your PhD, because then you have a very long downhill career afterwards. <laughs> okay. So sometimes students have this tendency to want to you know, get a better result and a better result. The PhD is the key to the playground. Okay? It's what you need to do to join the club and get in, but it's by no means the end. It's just the beginning. And it's good to leave yourself with lots of things to do. So if you can have a PhD that doesn't close in some sense, that makes it a lot easier to make the transition to being an independent researcher because you, you then have more things to keep doing that you're sort of familiar with, but you're doing them in a new way, not with your supervisor, but independently. So how do we go about trying to, to solve this problem of state space explosion? Well, as I said, the key thing that stochastic process algebras were bringing to the game was that we had formality and compositionality. So we wanted to exploit those, and we looked at a number of different ways. Um, the first is an approach called model simplification, where we look at equivalences between models, and basically you want to substitute one model for another, where the, the second model, the substitution, is somehow easier to solve. For state space explosion, that might be that it's smaller, so you've managed to make a smaller state space. Or it may be just that it belongs to a class where we know there's efficient solution methods. Okay, so for example, there are things called product form models which are easily decomposable. So if you can find an equivalent model to your model that's, that's product form, then you've got over the state space explosion problem. And we have a few results for stochastic post algebras there. What I'm going to say a little bit more is again, looking at state-to-state at -state equivalences to partition or quotient your state space and then make macro states. So this was kind of where my background in algebraic topology came out because this was something you do a lot in algebraic topology of using um, equivalence relations to quotient state spaces and things. So this seemed completely obvious to do to me but people hadn't done it previously with process algebras. Okay, so intuitively what the idea is that you have some kind of state space, you find some way of defining equivalence between states, so you identify the states within the model that are, have the same behavior, and then you just take one representation of each of those equivalence classes, taking care to make sure that your quantified information stays correct. So what we do then is we actually sacrifice looking at those individual components and shift instead to the aggregation, which is based on accounting abstraction. So rather than knowing exactly that processor one is the one that's currently doing task two, we just know that one of 10 processes is currently doing task two. So we've lost a little bit of information, but we've gained that we can do solve a lot larger models. Okay? So the syntactic nature of Pepper and the other stochastic process algebras made them easy to read. The fact that in our states what we did was we wrote down quite explicitly the structure of the model and the states of those each individual component within the model. But it wasn't necessarily the best thing for um, tools to use, in particular for these abstractions, to reduce models. So we shifted instead to a more numerical state representation where we count um, the components. 
So this is just to give you again the kind of intuition. So this is our, our processor resource. I've just slightly shortened the names to fit on the slides. So we've got three processors, two resources, and then these are the, the states if we really worry about the identity. Okay? So if we do a task one, well, it could be the first processor and the first resource that's synchronized, or it could be the first processor and the second resource, or the second processor, and so on. Okay, so we've got these different possibilities. But generally, we don't actually... Oh, and, and then the rates for those are going to be... Um, this is the total capacity, the minimum of the two capacities, uh, and then it's one-sixth for each one. But generally speaking, we don't need to actually distinguish the identities. We just need to know the counts. And so we can do what's called lumping and treat all those as a single state where we have this representation that this is the number of processor zeros, this is the number of processor ones, resource zeros, resource ones. And then we get this compact representation of all this. Now, in general, if you just take a Markov chain and lump states together, you don't have a Markov chain again. Okay? It, it just doesn't have the Markov properties. But we could use the process algebra structure to show that doing this kind of reduction does guarantee you're still a Markov chain. So this is a completely valid thing to do, and you'll get the same probability distribution as you would have got with the original model. So even if we do this, some models are still too big, okay? Because this will, will perhaps reduce things in order of magnitude, but that's not enough if we're talking hundreds of millions of states, as we are with some modern applications. So one alternative is that we run stochastic simulations <coughs> where we build our, our state space not explicitly all at once as a matrix, but we build it on the fly and we just generate the states. And what we do is we sample different behaviors by running a simulation and looking at trajectories. The problem with this, when what you're looking at is large state spaces, is that in order to get a good statistical representation, then you need to make many samples. And also, those sample paths themselves are very long. So this becomes quite time consuming. And so, Having spent, as I say, 10 years probably after my PhD, still trying to tackle this problem of state space explosion, uh, we were making progress, but not, not huge progress. We were still we were chipping away at the problem, really, from shattering it. And so something new was needed. And how that came about was actually kind of by going and thinking about something else. So what I got interested in was something called collective dynamics. So it's the idea where you have systems where you have, rather than really thinking about individuals, you're thinking about populations. Okay, so you might have a number of different entities that are all very similar, that interact in very simple ways, but you've got large numbers of them. Okay. And um, what we found was that if we look at such systems and ways of, of solving them, we can find ways of solving very big stochastic process algebra <coughs> models. And as I say, to do that, we have to get rid of the identity, so we st start thinking in terms of populations rather than individuals. And even what I call individuality, as you'll see, in that that counting abstraction becomes even more abstract because we're no longer constrained to really counting the naturals. We start approximating that with reals. Okay, so what's collective behavior? There are many instances from nature of things, um, it's sometimes called emergence. So the idea that you have very simple behaviors that interact locally but produce global or population phenomena. So these are actually birds swarming or flocking, I guess, birds swatting, bees swarming, and then fish doing whatever they do, which I'm not sure. But we also have man-made phenomena, which were the things that interested me more, with things like the spread of viruses, so how epidemics progress, comes out of very simple interactions between people and between populations, because of um, different pop portions of the populations are, are distinct populations with respect to the disease. Um, and this then creates an epidemic or not, 
according to those very simple local interactions between individuals will make a different outcome at the population level. We see it in the movement of people. This is the Love Parade in Germany in 2006. Sadly, in 2010, people were crushed at the Love Parade in Germany because um, the kind of collective dynamics went wrong. And we see it also in performance modeling. So systems like um, the tax office website has to suffer a sort of huge input of, of users, and it's very hard for them to predict whether their system is going to be up to performing in that circumstance because they don't know just what that um, peak flow is likely to be, what the timing characteristics. And scalability analysis has been a problem for performance for a long time because the models don't also suffer from the scalability. So it's very hard to produce models that allow you to really look at these scalability problems. So I started thinking about those. So my advice would be, you know, step outside your comfort zone, think about things that are, are different, and sometimes it can have quite unforeseen consequences. So primarily, actually, what got me started with collective dynamics was looking at biology and looking at cell biology. So there, my populations were proteins within cells, yeah, and we wanted to look at that. But looking at that sort of made us think about things differently. And what we realized was cross algebras are actually very good for describing such um, collective dynamic systems because you can have component types, like we had our processes and our resources previously, which have a logical behavior for everyone in that population. Okay? And then we have a compositional structure that shows us how those populations, those component types, interact with each other. And in general, the little examples I've shown you so far, you wouldn't call them populations because we're talking about three and two and things. But if you get up to hundreds, then we're talking about populations. But it's quite simple. It's only the same description as we had before. We just have to say we've got more copies. And then through the interactions of these populations, we can see these emergent behaviors. Okay, so this shift in perspective made us think quite differently about how we analyze these large models. Um, so, as I said, we don't look at individuals. We'd stop that for a while anyway, looking at aggregation. So we have these counts. But the new thing was that we realized that even these counts, we could start to approximate. So we've gone more abstract by counting. And then more abstract still by treating those counts as continuous. So this was quite new for process algebra because it, it's very much a discrete world. We're describing discrete events. We have a discrete description, but now we're giving it a, a kind of continuous semantics. And for a lot of these um, application areas, such as epidemiology, what they've traditionally done is fitted their data to standard ODE models. And this gave them the opportunity to start looking at how you might model in detail the interactions between individuals and then have your ODE models, as it were, emerge out of that description. And the group at Sterling has done a lot of work in this area. So the kind of applications we considered, as I say, large-scale software systems, scalability <coughs> has always been a difficult issue to in investigate with discrete state models because they suffer from the same problem of scalability biochemical signaling pathways, as I've mentioned, epidemiological models, and crowd dynamics. Particularly, we're interested in crowd dynamics where there's some kind of informatic intervention that you've got smart buildings that might be trying to direct people, um, and all people might have smartphones in the case of an emergency that can, a certain proportion of the population may be getting added information, for example, telling them that George Square in Glasgow is closed and that they need to head in a different direction. So just to give you an intuitive idea, how can we make this continuous approximation and why is it good? Well, if we think of a sparse population, so this is one of our state variables, so one dimension of our state space, and we just have a small population, then each action will increase or decrease our population by one, and proportionately, <coughs> That's a big thing. And it's also not going to happen all that often, because remember, these actions 
Uh, the more copies we have of a population, the more frequently we're looking to see the actions because the capacity increases. But as we increase the population, the frequency of actions will increase. And also the relative effect of those actions becomes much smaller. Okay, so if this is our total population, each one is just making a small shift. There's still actually discrete counts of one up and one down typically, but the proportion with respect to the population is much smaller. And so we get to the stage where we're not introducing that much inaccuracy if we treat this as, as continuous. It means when we look at the continuous results, it might tell us that we have 9.5 processes working. Clearly that's not true. We either have 9 or we have 10. But a lot of the measures that we can do, um, what that's telling us is that the proportionately within the time, 9.5 or 9.5 yes, 9 out of 10 um, capacity. So it's giving us an idea of what percentage of the capacity of processes is being dedicated to that task. So it means that we can describe the behavior of our system in terms of populations, in terms of ODEs. So what do we need to do? We make a counting abstraction, which we've already seen, and this involves generating a new structured operation of semantics, rather than the traditional one that directly gave us a CTMC, gives us a generator function. It means that we let that those um, counts subject to continuous change, we no longer get a probability distribution because we've made the system deterministic. Okay, so we're looking at ODEs that approximate the average behavior. So we're not look, seeing the variability. But nevertheless, those, that expected behavior that we see from the ODEs is enough for us to derive a lot of performance measures. So what do we, does it mean in terms of PEPA explicitly? Well, we're looking, as I said, at these kind of arrays of processes where we have populations, and then we can think for each action what it does to the counting variable. So if the component takes part in an action, so process zero does task one, then what that means is the number of process zeros will be decreased. Okay? If, on the other hand, it's the result of an action, so after task one, process zero becomes process one, then its amount will be increased. And if it's not involved in the action, there's no impact at all. So we can very straightforwardly look at um, our system, which previously had this huge state space, and take and sort of analyze it with respect to each of the actions. And we do this formally in terms of the semantics, but just to give you the intuition, and we can see, as I said, task zero decreases process zero and resource zero and increases process one and resource one. The other two actions, task two and task uh, re and reset, are individual to the different components. So this one only affects process um, and it decreases process one. So we do a task two, we take away process one and produce a process zero and similarly. And then... From that, we can derive ordinary differential equations. So x1 is the variable that's counting how many of these we have at any particular time. And what's going to take them away are the task ones. And this is the rate of task one. And what's going to produce them is the task twos. And this is the rate of task twos. As I say, this is all encoded in a semantics and a tool that will automatically generate these ODEs and then solve them for you. So just as a quick comparison, if we look at a system with 100 processors and 80 resources and simulation runs, we have a number of simulation runs. You see they differ quite a bit. This is the issue that we have to run many run, uh, simulations to get a statistically relevant sample. We get 10 runs, it's starting to get a bit better. Average of 10, 100 is better still. 1,000, we're really confident this is the average behavior, but this is exactly what the ODE gives us in a fraction of the time. So when we're looking at average behavior of populations, this really is a radically new and much more efficient approach. So I'm just going to finish with a small example, um, and it's just to kind of illustrate to you the use of different bits of the techniques that I've talked about as I went along. So this was a, an example of a virtual university. It came out of an EU project, 
and it was just used to try out different ideas within the project. But uh, you can guess which universities were involved in the project by the map. We have three down in Italy, LMU in Munich and University of Edinburgh. And then the idea is that you have students across Europe who may want to take courses at this virtual university and they can choose which of these universities in particular they take the content from. So it may be that they take one course from Edinburgh, another from Bologna, etc. It's not, it's not a real thing, we're not really planning to do this. As I say, it was an exemplar that we used to generate scenarios to demonstrate our techniques that we were developing within that project. So there were different scenarios. The one I'm talking about today is course selection scenario, being the idea that <coughs> students are interacting uh, with the virtual university through a web browser to gain information about what courses are available and which ones they can take and then registering for those courses, and it will be checked whether they have the necessary prerequisites and what have you. So the, the project as a whole was about <coughs> service-oriented computing, use of web services, etc. So the performance modeling was just one aspect of it. Um, we don't consider things like authentication within this scenario, and we assume that there is a constant population of students. So these are the students who've already matriculated um, with the virtual university. So the access to the system is through some university portal, some kind of web application, and this offers four distinct services in this case. A browsing, which lets the, the students search through the different offerings of, of courses. Course selection, where the student will choose some course, and then that will be validated to make sure that they have the necessary prerequisites um, and that it fits within the student's curriculum. The student will then um, have to do some confirmation, making sure that the information is up to date, that it really is this student registering for this course, and then there will be a confirmation, which is the final um, commit that this student is taking this course. Okay. So then we have, in terms of the structure of the system, we have this, this kind of um, portal. It's a bit like an e-commerce system where you can think of a front end, a business logic, and then a back end. So this is our business logic, and then at the back end we have a database and a, log, a logger that are keeping track of events. So this is the architecture for the system. This is our, our user population, the user interface, then the, the portal offering the different services connected to the, the database and the logger. And then these are our resources. We have one processor running the, the portal, and then another processor for the database and the loggers. Okay. So the portal um, has a number of threads. So generally, our population within this model, all our populations, students are real population. Otherwise, it's to do with threads. So each the portal will have a number of threads. The database will have a number of threads. And that's the kind of thing that we're interested in choosing the most appropriate number of threads to optimize performance within certain um, restrictions. Okay. Threads implement a session, so when a, a user comes along, they essentially get a thread on the university portal, they keep that thread, that thread is only for that student until that student has finished their interaction. And similarly, we have thread behavior in the database and the logger. Okay. If there's no threads available, when somebody makes a request, then the request is just um, queued, and as I say, this is contention, and this is where performance problems come from. So, interesting that. so generally, how we model things, this is just a schematic at the beginning. We assume that you have to access a processor to, in, in order to use any of its services. So we would have um, a processor in its first state, one, is acquired, and then offers a number of different service types. And then most of the interaction between components is <coughs> follows a kind of client-server pattern that you make, the client will make a request and then block until it receives a reply. And the server will receive the request, execute, and then generate the reply back. So the model is, I say, this is a toy example, but it still gets quite involved when we look at all the components. This is just to help you read the models and the patterns. Okay. So communication between A and B is then, so since A is the client and B is the server here, will be a cooperation or shared action on the set request and reply. 
the executor is just private within the, the server. Okay, and of course, this might those that, that execute might then involve requests to subsequent layers. Okay, so if we think first of the portal, it just offers these four services. So we get a request from a student for one of those services, and then each of those services has slightly different behavior. If we look at browsing, then its acquire here is to get some share of the processor, and then it makes a decision whether the information that this, the student has requested is in the cache or not in the cache. So here, it's assuming that 95% of the cases it will be in the cache and so it can be served internally just by this route or in 5% of the cases it will have to actually make an external request to the database to get the information. Okay, so in that case it makes a request, waits for the reply and then make, builds the response to the student. Okay, and you can imagine similar components for each of the other services. Okay, so the database, it will basically receive two different types of requests. It will have a request for read or a request for write. The read is just straightforward, it's just carried out um, and then replied. The write will carry out the write, but also it's logged. So the, the database itself then makes a request to the logger. So this is, is simple in terms of the actual thing, but the architecture of these interactions is, is fairly typical of how web services and, um, and web-based systems work. Okay, and then similarly here we have the logger. Okay, the, the processors just follow that pattern at the beginning where we acquire this, the database. So it's acquired, it carries out one of these actions, and then it, it has to be acquired again. In this case, we have a very simple student workload. Um, again, this is just to keep it simple on the slide, that we assume a student comes along and carries out these four actions in one session. Okay, so they, they pause for a while, they browse, they select a course, they confirm that course and register, and then they come around again. This can either be that it really is the same student thinking and coming back again, or there's a pause until the arrival of the next student. Either way. Okay. And then the actual structure of our system, so we've described all the components individually, we have to put them together. We have students, some number, we have a population NS of students when they start off thinking before they arrive. We have the portal and a number of threads. We have the database and the logger, so each of those have different number of threads. We have some validation within the portal that I'm not going to talk about, but it just has the same number of threads. So it's not um, changing anything, and then these are our processors, the processor for the portal and the processor for the database, and we've got levels of concurrency here. So we can start out um, thinking about the system in terms of individual components, which is a very sort of naive interpretation of the process algebra, but we see that the, the state space grows very quickly in this case. So um, well, we've only got one student, we've got no contention, because there's only one client, as it were, within the whole system, then the state space stays quite small, and altering the number of, of concurrency in the hardware has very little difference, as you might expect. But once we start to increase the number of students, even when we only have one thread, we've got much larger state space. <coughs> once we've got 10 students and some number of um, concurrency within the system, we've got 5 million states. Uh, that's not very good. But still, it can still be useful to use that naive interpretation in terms of identities to check the correctness of our system. So, as I said, when there's only one student in the system, um, it doesn't really make much difference what levels of concurrency you have because you're not going to use them. Um, but we can have a check that the system's really behaving the way that we want at this level. So, for example, when we have um, just one uh, level of concurrency in the processor that's handling the portal, then this is a model where we have two, port two threads in the portal, but only one processor. Then we want to check that it's always the case, if we look at these two instances, 
that one of them is in the idle state, so this state portal. Only one of them can be active at a time because there's only one processor to serve them. Okay? So that just gives us a sanity check that our model is behaving correctly. Now, the tool lets you walk through and do this uh, by hand if you want to, but we also can automatically generate uh, a description of the model for tools like the probabilistic model check in PRISM, and uh, in fact, you, you just give it Pepper as its input language, and it will let you check these things. We can even do some, some performance modeling with these small systems, because whatever the performance, as I said, with one student, so the response time you're getting there, it can only get worse when you add finished. And we can then go on to these more realistic models where we have 63 ODEs, just to show you the, the comparison, we're looking at a system here with 600 students. It takes 6.6 .6 seconds to do the ODE analysis, and the error is less than, well, it's 0.1%, so a very small error. But the time, if you run the simulations, is nearly 3,000 seconds. So I'll just skip this one. This is just saying that with the ODEs, it's so fast to solve that we can start doing an um, optimized search so say we've reached the, this configuration and we know that this response time is sufficient, we can then find that perhaps we can reduce some of the concurrency level and achieve the same response time and so use our, our system more efficiently. Okay. So what we've seen is that Pepper is now equipped with all these different interpretations uh, we have a fluid abstraction for these really large models. We have counting abstractions to help us with intermediate size and the individual view when we want a really detailed look. And these have different mathematical interpretations. It's been used for a number of different things. Um, it's proved to be a very rich topic. And in particular, we've, what we've been trying to do is, is take advantage of the formality of the process algebra in this context. Um, of the quantified analysis. And in particular, continuous approximation has um, given us a rich new <coughs> set of things. And to give you an idea of where we're going next, we're looking at how we can take advantage of that continuous approximation to do those um, formal analyses in terms of logics that I talked about at the beginning. Of, you know, How likely is it that I will reach a state that has this property within a certain time? Final things for you, a bit of advice. I'd say be bold, okay? Um, take advantages of what opportunities are out there, particularly to interact with people, both your peers and more established researchers. When I was a PhD student, much as I loved Robin Milner's work, I was terrified of talking to him because I thought he would turn around and tell me, you can't add quantification into my beautiful process algebra. And it was only some years after he'd left Edinburgh that I plucked up the courage to talk to him and had some very stimulating discussions, and he, he wasn't at all like that about the work. So do take advantages of what chances you have to talk to people. Get used to rejection. It's a fact of life in an um, academic world. We all love it when we get a paper accepted, but you should remember that means somebody else has had their paper rejected. So when your paper gets rejected, don't let it crush you and feel your research is no good. Just look at how you can improve it. Perhaps explain it better next time. And remain optimistic. There are setbacks. But basically, as I said, it's a playground. And you should have fun in it. Thank you for your attention. I should thank my collaborators, particularly the fluid work was done with Stephen Gilmore and Michael Tripistoni. And if you want to find out more about Pepper, either talk to me in the next couple of days or have a look at the Pepper website. Thank you. <coughs>